Hello, Oscillator Sync here. On the OPZ, while a sequence is playing, there are a number of different ways that we can interact with the performance, other than the obvious playing in notes or changing the parameters of the sounds. There are three main methods that we have to interact with the performance. The first are the punch-in effects, an idea which are kind of borrowed from the pocket operators where we can change the sounds or the tonality in real time by punching these little effects as we go. The next is the master track, which allows us to play with the uh, scale or modality of what's currently playing. Allowing us to create um, variations in that way. The master track probably deserves its own video, uh, but it is really kind of almost the song mode of the APZ in, in a lot of ways. The final way that we have is the tape track. And for me, the tape track is probably the most interesting uh, of the three, but I didn't always think that. In fact, for a long time, I kind of didn't really like it and didn't really get it. Um, so in this video, what I'd like to do is um, talk about the tape track, uh, how it works, and how that led me to a particular way of using it, which I particularly enjoy. So let's talk about what the tape track actually is. So while there's music playing on the OPZ, there's kind of a virtual tape loop that's been recorded in the background, uh, which is synchronized to the, the, the sequence. And as it gets to the end of the loop, a new section of the sequence is recorded onto it. Now by pressing the lower keys here, we're able to jump into that tape loop, parts of that tape loop, and create micro loops inside it. So for example, You can hear that it's changing because the tape loop has been overwritten as it goes. We can jump to a different area. And you get these kind of tape stutter uh, uh, effects, which are really, really cool. The black keys here decide how long that um, loop is. So at the moment it's set to three. So when we create a micro loop, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Yeah. Uh, and then as we go to two, two, one, much, much shorter. And so on. So we can create different micro loops within our tape loop. Up at the top here, we have these first two, the, the green and the blue uh, controls here, which give us our sort of tape controls. So while we're playing down one of these micro loops, uh, the blue control allows us to speed it up to double speed, so an octave up functionally, or down to half speed. The green control allows us to do much more wild um, changes to the speed, so this is at minimum at the moment, as I turn it up very quickly, it goes much faster and then much slower. So at minimum, we're back to normal. At full, we're so slow that you can barely hear anything happening at all. Now, when I uh, saw people using the tape track, especially people like Cuckoo, they were very, very deft at using the tape track to create these sorts of uh, tape wobbles and stutters. And and it always sounded really, really right when they used it. And whenever I tried to use it, it sounded terrible. And I don't know whether that's because I, I lacked dexterity or the music I was making didn't suit it, but I just couldn't get on with the tape track. It never felt right it never felt useful to me and so for a long time I kind of uh, ignored it and abandoned it but um, doing a little bit of reading um, and not necessarily in the manual uh, in forums uh, and the like I started to understand the tape track a little bit better and I started to understand how I might use it 
more musically. And it's that kind of journey that I'm going to share with you today. So the first thing that kind of bugged me with the tape track was to do with the way that the sound jumped in. Um, so let me see if I can show you this to you. It's subtle, but it really, really bugged me. And I'm sorry if you've never really heard this before and it's going to ruin the tape track for you. So skip this part if, uh, if you don't want to be exposed to this. As we bring in the tape track to create our micro loops, there is a very short fade in and then a very short fade out at the end. As things get interrupted. And I've got to tell you that that softness of attack always really uh, bugged me because I kind of wanted, if I, if I was going to do these tape stutter effects, which as I said, I wasn't good at anyway, but if I was doing them, I wanted them to be instant and harsh. I didn't really mind if there was almost a click there and that fade in, fade out just always frustrated me. So this is what you can do about that fade in and fade out. And I think really this is really the, the, the key to the way that I use the tape track now. And as far as I can tell, this isn't documented in the manual. I saw this mentioned in passing uh, on a forum post that I can't find anymore. But here's the thing. The tape track doesn't need to interrupt what's playing. It can play on top of it. So if you hold down the track button and turn up the red control when you're in tape mode, what this does is um, it essentially mixes the dry signal back into the tape. So with it down at the bottom here, we're always totally um, interrupting the track that's playing. If we hold down track and turn up the red control, and now the tape track and the stutter effects that you get from it are now playing in parallel with your main sound. And that immediately for me becomes a much more attractive proposition. So the next thing that kind of bothered me with the default tape track setup is that um, when you introduce these stutter effects, It's everything has been thrown into the mix here. So your drums are, are being stuttered, which can sound cool sometimes. But if you happen to catch something at an awkward time, it just interrupts the flow of, of what's going on in a way that um, often didn't feel that musical to me. So the, the next thing that um, I kind of explored with the tape track that brought me to a place of love rather than... Uh, uh, dissatisfaction was the fact that you don't need to run everything into the tape track. You can be selective. So when you're in the tape track, if you hold down shift, you can see that uh, all of the tracks here are lit up yellow at the moment. And any track that's currently lit up yellow will be sent in to the uh, tape track. Now, if we decide that we don't want all of these things to be sent into the tape track, for example, if I don't want my drums or maybe uh, not my kick and my snare, I can turn them off or turn off all the drums perhaps. Uh, and now when I do these stutter effects, my drums are allowed to carry on behind the scenes, um, unaffected by the tape stutter. So the next thing that helped me um, come to love the tape track was um, at the moment when we're doing these stutter effects, even though we haven't got our drums in there, everything seems to clash a little bit because the tonality of the tape track is exactly the same. It's a nice clean digital signal uh, when compared to the sequence that's actually playing, which can be a positive thing, but um, it's part of what sometimes makes it feel a little bit cluttered to my ears. So an important um, thing to recognize is that on the yellow and red controls, when the lights are um, white, you have access to the filter the same way you have on, on pretty much every other track. So that means that we can take our tape track and change its tonality so that it sits apart from the rest of the track. Maybe even give it some resonance.
So now it's kind of sitting apart from um, the rest of the track a little bit. And it starts to become a bit more of an instrument that's playable. And this is starting to appeal to me a lot more than it was originally. What can make it appeal to me more? Well, it's the same thing that makes most things appeal to me. And that is that uh, on the second um, set of um, parameters here, so by tapping shift here, we can get into our panning, our volume. So we can turn down the volume of the track if we think it's um, overpowering, but we also have our effect sense here. So at the moment I'm set uh, to delay and reverb. So that means that we can take our um, tape track Instantly, when you stop the sequencer, the last section of tape stays in memory. So that's a useful thing if you're trying to fine tune the tonality of things. And we can start to give it some. Nice reverb. Maybe a bit of delay as well. Drop its volume a tiny bit. So uh, uh, now this feels like part uh, another instrument, which is really, really important uh, for me um, uh, anyway. Uh, the next thing that you can, that I like to do, um, now usually it is true that um, half speed is best speed. Almost a universal fact, but uh, for the tape track on the OPZ, for me personally, It's, uh, it's double speed that's the best speed. Um, so now we have... A stuck note somewhere for some reason. There we go. Ladies and gentlemen, the OP said, stuck notes sometimes. Um, so now we have, uh, uh, for me, a much more playable instrument that works um, alongside what I already have in the track. So one final kind of piece of the puzzle, and this isn't um, part of the tape track setup that I always use, but I think it's worth exploring, is that now we have a tape track which is set up to be an instrument, kind of, that's based around our input, it's worth noting that we can now sequence this instrument as well. So we can lay down steps uh, with different parts of the tape assigned to them, if you like. Um, so um, just lay down a bunch of steps here. Uh, and we can now have these steps jump around uh, inside our track. And we can mute this track if we want to as well, to take this element out. Oh, sorry, actually mute the right track. Still have access to it to play manually. which essentially gives us a, another um, harmonic, uh, rhythmic idea that we can introduce to our 
track. The other thing to bear in mind is that you're also still able to parameter lock things um, within these steps as well. So for example, we could set it so that um, maybe this, that step's a half step, half time step. That one's a, a normal. Uh, and then we could parameter lock some panning. And we've got kind of a turn off the wrong again. We've got a, a whole extra instrument that's built up and musically related to the stuff that's going into it. Of course, we could take elements out of it if we wanted to. If we don't want that lead line in there. And we could change the length of the micro loops. We could still, if we're brave, hit it with a one of those boys. I'm not good at that stuff. I'll leave that to Cookie. But um, by finding a way to use the tape track as more of a instrument that sits alongside the rest of the composition, this is where I learned to live, learn to love the tape track, and why I think actually it's more interesting than the punching effects um, in terms of performance elements, because it's a little bit more playable. I think the punching effects are really good fun occasionally, but I think laying into them too much starts to make the OPZ always sound like the OPZ because they all have a very particular uh, character to them. And I think this is much more about relating to the music that you've written, in my opinion anyway. Anyway, I hope that was uh, interesting and useful. If you've got an OPZ, then I um, encourage you to try uh, and explore the tape track, maybe in ways that you haven't thought about, because um, it has a lot to give, I think. If you did enjoy the video, then uh, as always, it would be massively appreciated if you could leave a like, uh, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, Leave a comment in the comment section if you have something you want to say. It's always hugely appreciated. But um, as always, thank you so much for joining me. And until next time, take care.